Hello again and welcome back to the UK edition. So who's going to have the majority in here? We'll know in a few days. We will decide in a few days. On what's likely to happen, we'll have an expert view in just a bit. But first, to sample another constituency, we were earlier in Brentford and Isleworth and in Slough. This weekend, to Barking in East London. Barking constituency in East London is a buzzing mix of people of different backgrounds and varying origins. The constituency now sees the established old order being challenged by the unexpected new. The Conservatives are fielding Tamkeen Sheikh, originally from Ahmedabad in India, against Margaret Hodge from Labour, who was MP from here in the last parliament. The constituency has seen Margaret Hodge at odds with her own party leadership over what she sees as its failure to check anti-Semitism in the party. Anti-Semitism exists across Europe and across the political spectrum, but I never, ever thought that I would experience significant anti-Semitism as a member of the Labour Party. I have, and it has left me feeling an outsider in the party of which I've been a member for over 50 years. Margaret Hodge declined to speak with us, but we did have a word with Tamkeen. The ethos that uh, me as an Indian I'm brought up with, they match with the Tories because Tories believe in empowering people. Yes, we, we can give away free stuff, but by the end of the day, somebody has to pay in this world, nothing is free. And it has been historical that whenever Labour government leaves, they leave the country bankrupt. That is their history. And it's Conservatives who build the country and bring it back up. So like the majority in this constituency of Barking, I voted leave and I warn that Brexit should be delivered. It has been more than three years that people have voted leave and it has not been delivered. It is a deadlock in the parliament and I think it is very important that people come out and vote for the Conservative government because it's only the Conservatives who will be able to deliver Brexit, a majority of them, yeah. Local Pakistani leaders here are campaigning hard for support to Hodge. This is a pattern evident in constituencies across the country. On that, we spoke with Alderman Mushtaq Lashari, a senior member of the Labour Party. Is this an election where the Indian vote is going overwhelmingly the Conservative way and the Pakistani vote the Labour way? We've been hearing a good deal about this and a good deal from the Indian side, but do let's have a Pakistani view on this. Mushtaq Saab, it does appear that the Pakistani community is voting strongly and in fact en masse for Labour in this election. I think the Labour Party has uh, 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 been supported by Pakistani overwhelmingly uh, historically and particularly in this election the manifesto of the Labour Party is much more attractive to the people of Pakistan or anybody who has come from overseas living in the United Kingdom. And I believe that three, four generations have passed, but still the Labour Party support stands very solid from uh, third world countries' migrants. But the manifesto is not equally appealing to all migrants. It appears to be especially appealing to the Pakistani community. Why is that? I think it should appeal to all migrants. The reason is because the Labour Party will create more jobs, it will invest in NHS, it will invest in education, so generally uh, it will be more pro-people's manifesto and a government which will bring peace in the world as well. Because people of third world countries are now uh, very uh, uh, opposed to the wars and unrest. As you can understand in 60s, 70s, First migration was on economic reason and then the second and third was sometimes very pro uh, uh, because of the situation in those third world countries. So they came here as refugees. But we are talking particularly about India and Pakistan here. There is a very definite political issue that arises from uh, the subcontinent that is being played out here. We have the government of Pakistan officially asking the Pakistani community here to support uh, Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn. They have said in an official statement they want Jeremy Corbyn to win. So clearly the people in the building uh, right behind you must be actively campaigning for Labour here. I think it is not true. The reason is Jeremy Corbyn has been historically very supportive of India. And they, uh, he was very supportive of non-aligned movement. If you look at the non-aligned movement 
movement. India was a leading uh, party to non-aligned movement, and Jeremy Corbyn is strongly supporter of non-aligned movement. Non-alignment, Mushtaq Saab, is now a distant history by uh, the standards by which today's uh, pace of change uh, can be measured. But the fact is that there is an issue about Kashmir, over which India is concerned. Jeremy Corbyn has taken a certain position. On Kashmir, of course, we have conflicting narratives. We know what those narratives are. But as they are being played out here, is that a factor that is appealing to the Pakistani community in the Labour position, and particularly with Jeremy Corbyn? I think there are, again, two reasons. Number one, the present government in India ha has done a atrocities with Kashmiris over the last 110 days. And it has created a movement of Kashmiris who are in majority uh, from Pakistani region in living in the United Kingdom. And Labour Party has always stood on human rights and international issues and worked with the uh, third world countries to be a peaceful uh, negotiated settlement of their disputed areas. Mushtaq Saab, yes, I, I hear what you say, but of course this is a conflicted matter. Uh, there are different narratives as we are saying. Certainly the Indian position is that uh, the guns and bombs being used by terrorists don't grow in Dal Lake. They are coming from Pakistan, that Pakistan is supporting terrorism. We know those narratives and uh, that apart, the question here and the narrower question here is exactly in what way uh, is the Pakistani community mobilizing itself or being mobilized by the Pakistani government to back Jeremy Corbyn? I, I don't think the Pakistani government or Indian government or BJP or other political parties from third world countries should get involved in British elections. We know that uh, Russia got they involved. Should not. In they should not, but we have an official statement from the Pakistani government. I think it, it should not. I, I, I'm saying it and Labour Party should not take notice of that because generally, as I said, uh, um, uh, Labour Party has passed two resolutions, one in 1995, another one a few weeks back in their conference supporting the Kashmiri right to uh, uh, self-determination and implementing the United Nations resolutions. I think it is important that the people of third world countries should look through their conscience and vote to the party which is closer to their philosophies, their ideology, and not listen to their uh, narrative governments back home. Right. Now, is there also a religious element coming into this? Because we do hear that even across mosques, uh, there is a call going out that the Pakistani community should vote Labour. I think there are two speculations, too much speculation happening. I have heard from candidates of Labour Party that BJP and Government of India is opposing me and Indian government is supporting the Conservative Party. So these are all speculation. We don't have any evidence. But you said that there was a statement from Government of Pakistan. I think it is wrong and they should not issue statement involving in a international country which is sovereign country and uh, uh, the election should not uh, be uh, uh, any country, sovereign country should not involve into election matters of another country. Finally, Mushtaq Saab, we are seeing because of speculations, fears or fair reasons, let's say, a division opening up within the Asian community here, the South Asian community, and we are all here in the same space. So is this something that is unfortunate and what can be done on all sides to check it, reduce it and in fact to eliminate it? I think it is it is a wonderful. I was in a, a constituency day before yesterday in in uh, uh, Hounslow and I saw Seema Malhotra sitting on the same stage where Hina Malak was sitting from Liberal Democrat. So I think the community and in the audience, there were people who were supporting Conservative Party from Pakistani region. There were people who are supporting Liberal and Labour as well from Pakistani Indian and local indigenous population. I think we should work. And as you know, Third World Solidarity is working for peace, justice and tolerance and democracy. And we should not get involved into the matters which are back our homes. Yes, sentiments are there, our families are affected, but I believe and we should work together, Indian communities, Pakistani communities and all the others based on our ideologies and philosophies and the political parties which are more uh, supportive of our rights uh, of equality in these countries. Thank you very much for sharing your views. Always a pleasure, always very enlightening to hear from you. Thank you very much. So that was, one hesitates to say, a view from the other side. But a short break now and then let's have that expert view on what's likely in this election.
Welcome back and a word now with Professor Tony Travers from the Department of Government at the London School of Economics on just what we could expect come Friday. Professor Travers, uh, we are into, of course, the election a few days from now. What does it look like? The polls suggest stories clearly. Is it that clear? Well, we are in the last few days of what's been a long campaign. I mean, not long by some countries, but long by British standards. And the polls have shown the Conservatives about 10 percentage points ahead, 42 to 32, through most of the period. It's been a bit of narrowing in the last couple of weeks. But in the end, it does look as if the Conservatives are on course to being the biggest party and probably winning a majority in the election. But the biggest party can be a tricky expression as we hear, or that it may mean that it will still form, uh, fall short of actually making government. But it does look like Tories will make the government clearly. Well, as in all big uh, democracies, you can never be sure till the votes are counted. And against that backdrop, even though the Conservatives are still showing opinion poll leads, of course they could narrow in the last few days or on the day, and even if the Conservatives were the biggest party but didn't have a majority, that would leave Britain in almost the same position it was before the general election, with a minority government unable to get Brexit or indeed any other policies through with, with any ease. But there seems very little risk of that, isn't it? Going by present trends. Yes, at the moment uh, all the evidence is the Conservatives are on course for a majority government, but you know, as in all countries with all elections, you can never be 100% certain until all the votes are counted on, in our case, Friday at the end of this week. Looking at this election, it does appear part referendum and part election. Is it possible to discern really which part is referendum, which part is election? Because Brexit does appear to be a prime issue here. There's no doubt that the 2016 referendum, which produced a 52% leave, 48% remain vote, has become a sort of culture war inside British politics. It overlays traditional left-right politics. So the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, the main parties, are now people identify less with them than they do with leave and remain, which is remarkable given the Conservative Party is 150 or more years old. So it has transformed politics, which is not to say that traditional issues like the National Health Service, education and so on are not still present in the election, but they're overlaid by leave and remain and by the whole Brexit issue, which remains unsorted. You know, the position of the Labour Party on Brexit has been a bit perplexing to many of us. It seems to have evolved. Do we know in a nutshell what that position is? Is it that if they win, they will do another agreement and then put that to the vote? Well, Brexit, the Labour Party's Brexit policy is complicated. It's evolved over many, many, well, actually years now, several years now, to being one where they say that they would renegotiate the Brexit deal that the Conservatives have done, two actually deals so far. So Labour would renegotiate it, and then when they'd done that, they'd put this renegotiated deal to the public in a referendum with remaining in the EU as an alternative. Complicatedly, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has said he wouldn't support either side in such a referendum, which adds a further degree of complexity. Have they spelled out what they will renegotiate, what they want different? Is it that they want a customs union? Will that be the significant change they would bring to the current draft agreement? I mean, what Labour want is protection for jobs, workers' rights, environmental policy, so a much, much closer relationship with the EU than the one the Conservatives have been saying that they want. So it will be a renegotiation back to a much closer relationship with the EU than Boris Johnson and before him Theresa May were talking about. Lib Dems came into this election as the clear Remain party, but they seem to have lost their way, haven't they? It's true, the Liberal Democrats who helped trigger this general election actually uh, thought they were going to do really well, get more votes, and that's new seats, uh, and many new seats, I think they hoped. And indeed, Joe Swinson, the Liberal Democrat leader, at one point was saying that she would be the next Prime Minister. Well, as it's turned out, the longer the election's gone on, the more people have seen of the Liberal Democrats and their leader, the less popular they've become. So I think what's happened here is that in our, this kind of uh, electoral system, 
with the first past the post voting arrangement, it forces people to choose between one party that might win or the other party that might win. And the Liberal Democrats, I'm afraid, most people think can't win, therefore they're losing votes. You know, you mentioned that very interesting exchange with the voter where a lady in the Midlands said she doesn't trust Boris Johnson, but she likes him. Is there a gap opening up between the position people take on issues and the personalities, the persons leading the parties? There's no question that personalities matter much more in politics, and not only in the UK, than they used to. And that people want to have leaders, particularly heads of government, that they recognise and that they like, or at least they feel are powerful, whatever it is. And so in that sense, the fact that Boris Johnson is highly visible, much recognised, people love to have their selfies taken with him in the streets, uh, helps the Conservatives, and he is more popular as a leader than either Jeremy Corbyn for Labour or Joe Swinson for the Liberal Democrats, by some margin more popular. If Boris Johnson comes into the government, is there a chance or a risk, let's say, that Britain will lose Scotland? Well, certainly if the Conservatives form a majority government, I think more people in Scotland are likely to favour independence. But of course, the challenge is that if there's a Conservative majority government, it almost certainly wouldn't allow another referendum in Scotland to take place. Paradoxically, if there were a Labour government or a minority Labour government, they'd be much more likely to allow a referendum, but it would be less likely that people in Scotland would vote for independence. So it doesn't look as if there's going to be a referendum in the short term, but almost certainly will be one within the next five years at some point. There's some sort of a South Asian split that appears to be opening up in this election, with the Indians voting apparently by trends that are indicative, uh, overwhelmingly Tory now, while the Pakistani vote goes to Labour. And between the two, you have between one and two million votes. Um, so it can be a very significant vote, particularly in a close contest. How are you seeing this sort of split opening up and this sort of importation of South Asian politics into the election here? There's no question that in constituencies, uh, where there are large numbers of South Asian voters, so that's particularly in London, but also in Birmingham and Leicester, uh, and other big cities. Uh, uh, there is differentiation amongst uh, South Asians from different countries and indeed different religions. So Indians, Hindus and Sikhs have been shifting towards the Conservatives now for some time, in fact, whereas Muslims from Pakistan, India and Bangladesh are much more likely to vote Labour. So, uh, you know, in some ways, this is simply becoming a more plural vote within the broad South Asian population. And you can see it, you know, behaving very differently. You go to Harrow in northwest London, there's clearly a substantial South Asian vote voting Conservative. Otherwise, the Conservative MP wouldn't get back there each time. I mean, a lot of people say that this is not the way it should be. Of course, it's another question what should be and what is. But is this uh, being uh, seen as somehow divisive of the South Asian uh, community here, if you think of that as a single whole in any sense at all? I don't think it's particularly divisive. No, I mean, you know, groups of voters, let's take an earlier group of voters, Jewish voters in Britain. Jewish voters have long been plural. Some of them vote Conservative, some vote Labour. Perhaps at the moment more of them not so sympathetic to Labour for reasons uh, that have to do with issues that the Labour Party is facing. So I don't think that, you know, in a sense, if South Asian voters over time gradually start to vote, you know, 50% for one party, 50% the other, or at least equally for different parties, in a sense that's just a sign that they are becoming more like the population that they or their parents or grandparents moved to. So, you know, I think it's just part of the normal movement of politics. Finally, sir, uh, the manifesto. Uh, there are some differences that uh, do stand out. And seen from the South Asian perspective, there is clearly a difference in the foreign policy statements. The Labour Party is puts Kashmir as the first place in its uh, uh, policy objectives that it will focus on and want a resolution on of the kind that it would like to see. Is this becoming a significant factor in this election, Kashmir? Well, Kashmir... I think it's an issue which, for the Labour Party, the Labour Party has a number of foreign policy issues that its core members who control the party are very interested in. Kashmir would be one, Palestine would be another. 
in a way that differentiates Labour quite substantially, in fact, from the Conservatives, who have a more traditional, mainstream, widely understood approach to these kind of international affairs issues. So if there were a Labour government, there's no doubt that its relationship with India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, would be probably substantially different than the relative mainstream we've seen from the Conservatives and even Labour uh, politicians in the past. Thank you very much, sir. We'll have a better idea, of course, a week from now, and we look forward to hearing from you again on election night. Thank you very much for Thanks speaking with us. Thank you. So we wait to see who and what we'll wake up to on Friday morning, if we sleep at all. So see you now next weekend. There will be much to talk about.